and welcome to today's second webinar. Thank you so much for taking time out and being here today. And my name is Ayoung. I am the host of this webinar and also I am the marketing and educational seminar coordinator here at Neo Biotech. And this is me right here. And hello and welcome again. So today's agenda is really simple. I will introduce our topic and the presenter and also go over some communication tools. And I will also go over upcoming webinars and also watch previous webinars. And lastly, I'm also going over how to receive your C credits. So please stay until the end. And let's also connect it with us uh, on social media. Our Facebook page is right here, Neo Biotech USA. And here's the Instagram page is Neo Biotech. Um, there should be underscore USA and YouTube is Neo Biotech USA. So uh, follow us and you will see most up to date of our um, surgical kits and uh, also our webinars as well. So um, here are our three social medias. So today's topic is the uh, all, all next treatment, uh, treatment planning, surgical and restorative sequencing with Dr. Owen Train. And also we are strongly recommended to use the chat box to communicate with me, the host, um, ask technical issues. And we will have a Q&A session at the end. So please submit your questions through this Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. And one thing that I wanna address is um, Dr. Chen may not answer all of your questions since we have a short period of time. Okay, then let's right jump into our webinar. Uh, let's have Dr. Chen to start today's webinar. Good afternoon, Dr. Chen, how are you doing? Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon, doctor. Here you go. Now I can How see are you. you? I'm doing great. How are you doing, doctor? I'm doing well. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Owen Trin. Um, so without further ado, let me kickstart my keynotes to share it with you. All right. Um, so I want to thank you, everyone, and kind of welcome everyone um, to the webinar. And thank you for lending me your time. Um, Hey, on you, did I share my keynote with you? No, doctor. Um, oh, okay. I, Let me, yeah. Sorry about that. That's um, fine. All right, here we go. That's good? Yes, there you go, okay. doctor. All right, guys. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for lending me your time. Um, I hope you and your loved ones um, continue to stay healthy as we um, return to the work of dentistry uh, with a heavy dose of caution, of course. Um, so first off, some information about myself. Um, I currently practice and teach the AHED program in the Air Force um, as part of my payback commitment for the health scholarship program. Um, I also practice in the civilian practice part-time. Um, I'm a board certified prosthodontist. Um, I did my training at the University of Minnesota where I had a lot of exposure to both uh, periodontal and prosthodontic procedures that involve grafting, placing, and restore um, simple to um, complex full arch implant treatment. And I want to give a shout out to the university and the prost department at uh, the University of Minnesota. They did a great job. Um, my email is listed here um, in case you need to contact me after the presentations. So um, the topic we have today is all next treatments. And before we start, I just want to make sure we are on the same page with the terminology. So on X is an extension of um, an on for a term which was um, trademarked by Palomalo for a fixed full arc prosthetic supported by four implants. However, this type of treatment has been existed since the time of Brennamark. So to keep it simple, when we talk about fixed implant supported full arc prosthetic treatment, we simply refer to it as on X. So the letter X referred to the number of implants used to support, used to support the prosthesis. So between the fixed implant supported option like an on X versus a remove, removable implant supported option like an over, over dentures or fixed hybrid, which is the better and which category of patient that would fit in each treatment modality? So the answer to that is that it depends on where you practice dentistry. Um, European patients prefer implant over denture because they want to be able to remove and clean the denture. 
but U.S. patients who are edentulous or suffer from debilitating dentition prefer a fixed modality like an RNX because of you know, cultural norm and lifestyle preferences. So for U.S. patients, the initial cost of an RNX treatment tend to be a lot higher than the removable option. Um, but the cost should not be the deciding factor because um, there are other clinical parameters that decide um, if RNX is the right treatment for that particular patient. So our job as clinicians, whether your scope of practice is a restorative or surgical or both, is to help patients decide if RNX treatment is the right treatment for them. So this webinar is an introduction to the topic of RNX. Um, even though I'm going to talk about this topic at great length today, um, but please keep in mind that it's not possible to learn all we need to learn about RNX in one short set, uh, webinar. So I hope Neobiotech and I can further collaborate um, to develop a series of um, RNX lectures that will help you with learning about RNX. So to kind of keep things easy for, for you to follow, my agenda today is to explain the premise of RNX and what it means for us as clinicians and for our patients. Um, discuss when RNX is indicated and what type of clinical parameter we need to look for in order to make the determination. I will talk about the protocol we use to create um, diagnostic reference point when we try to determine restorative space in, intraorally and radiographically. Then I will show you the exact amount of restorative space you would need based on the type of restorative material and hygienic reference for your patients. And I will review um, guided versus non-guided RNX surgery. Um, discuss the three-dimensional implant arrangement for um, RNX protocol so that you can maximize implant fixations and um, avoid um, costly bone grafting procedure. Um, I will discuss the benefit of um, angle posterior implants in the fixed hybrid treatment. Uh, I will discuss the purpose of us doing immediate loaded long-term provisional. Um, it's also known as immediate conversion. And finally, I will show you two case example, two case, two case example. Um, each case represents different management aspect of RNX protocol. So at the basic level, um, an RNX is a fixed implant supported bridge, meaning that 100% that is 100% supported by implants and the patient cannot remove it. The prosthesis itself can be made from a combination of custom titanium bar and denture acrylic, or um, it can be fabricated from a monolith, um, monolithic zirconia oxide or um, a technopolymer materials. Um, the treatment utilized four or more implants uh, for full arch rehabilitations. And most of the time it requires bone reductions to provide um, adequate restorative space. And in order for us to hide the uh, prosthetic transition line, um, the treatment, the protocol involves posterior implants that are angled up, up to 45 degrees to allow more anchorage to bones and for us to avoid critical anatomy. Um, there are instances where you can play straight posterior implants, and I will talk more about it later in the later part of the webinar. Um, another thing about the protocol is we want to minimize the distal cantilever extensions. And one of the biggest benefits of this treatment for us as provider is to provide patients with an immediate loaded full arch provisional on the day of surgery. And this concept utilizes cross arch uh, implant stabilization concept um, lastly, but not always, from time to time, um, this, treatment, this treatment protocol requires a multidisciplinary approach between you, the restorative dentist, and the surgical dentist. If, but if you are doing both, that's great. So the question is, how does RNX protocol benefit our patients? So first off, is provide edentulous patient or patient with um, terminal dentition with a fixed full arch prosthesis that does not incorporate um, denture flanges or palatal coverage of a typical denture or overdenture. Um, it's enable patient to um, return home on the day of surgery uh, with a fixed provisional that is relatively acceptable in aesthetic, phonetic, and functions. So overall, an RNX protocol reduces the number of procedures and the treatment length because it's eliminate the need for having implant completely covered while waiting for surgical healing and also integrations. So case in point, um, the patient you see on the screen was in her late 50s with failing upper dentition due to root caries and um, periodontal disease. And um, she also had to put up with an aesthetic looking smile for the majority of her life. Um, you could make the same argument for her lower dentition. 
at the time, I try to keep her low dentition for as long as possible, and as long as she be, she be able to maintain them. So basically, I perform an extraction and place six, six upper immediate implants and restore her with an all next prosthesis, which was fabricated from denture acrylic, uh, wrapped around a custom titanium bar. And let's look at the, the transformation. So as you can see, the treatment not only restore her functionality, but it's in, in, enable um, a new way of life for a patient like her who struggled to keep up with um, non-healthy and non and unesthetic smile for years. So the benefit to the clinicians with the RNX protocol, uh, first off, is allow us to offer implant dentistry to a um, rising population of edentulous patients and to patients with debil debilitating dentition. Um, the last time I looked, according to the market-to-market -market data, um, the U.S. implant market for this demographic was 1.5 billion back in 2018, and that number had far exceeded in 2020. Um, the RNX protocol is a single-day implant procedure for the most part, um, so you tend to have higher treatment plan acceptance from the patient, which is great for your practice building. Um, because we utilize tilted posterior implant placement protocol, we're able to reduce surgical complexity like extensive vertical bone wrapping or sinus augmentations, and therefore we reduce surgical morbidity. Um, and we will look more closely at the concept of tilted implant later in the webinar. So before I dive deep into the details, I want to kind of give you an overview of um, the RNX protocol. So the first step is diagnosis and treatment plan where you determine if um, the patient is a good candidate for RNX. So this step includes um, diagnostic imaging and fabrication of the transitional prosthesis and surgical guide. It could either be a freehand pilot guide or a fully guided um, drill guide. So at this stage, you have the option to transition the patient from dentate to edentulous, or you can go straight from dentate to extractions and implant surgery all on the same day. And phase two to six, um, it all happens on the day of implant surgery. And this involves bone reductions, um, follow that with implant placement, um, conversion of the transitional prosthesis to a long-term implant um, provisional. Um, the final phase is the fabrication of the definitive prosthesis after the healing is complete. The key element of this whole complex protocol is actually the diagnostic and treatment planning phase. It's because we need to formulate a sound treatment and ex execution plan. Uh, we need to be able to visualize the final outcome before we actually commit the patient. So the first portion of today's webinar um, is how to decide if our patient is the right candidate for all next treatment. And later in the webinar, we will talk um, about the intricacy of the actual treatment itself. So the first um, clinical parameter I look for is lip support. So let's look at the patient um, as an illustration. The left photo, uh, excuse me, sorry. The left photo is a patient um, with a typical flat facial one third because of lack of lip support when he's without his dentures. The right photo is the, the, of the same patient with the definitive prosthesis. Um, he has a natural smile, proper teeth display and lip support that we want to achieve. Um, the question I asked myself during the diagnosis and treatment plan is, if I do an all and treatment on him, would it be possible to support his lips solely by a combination of pink prosthetic or pink acrylic and artificial teeth um, with an on x prosthesis. So let's look at, let's take a look at how this patient, let's look at, the, I'm sorry, let's look at this patient from the lateral view. So anatomically, we know the edentulous maxilla resorb inward in the anterior and outward in the posterior. If he wear a dentures, the buccal flange of a denture make up for the hard and soft tissue loss in the anterior maxilla and help maintain the upper lip support. So the patient who already have wear dentures, what, typically I, what I typically do is um, I take lateral photo of the patient with and without the dentures. And if I determine if the lip is under supported, I ask myself, is it because the label position of the denture teeth or because the buccal flange of the denture is under contour? And if it's the flange, then I would add wax to the flange to see if I can improve the lip profile. Here come the important questions. Will I still be able to maintain the lip support without the benefit of the denture or facial flange? 
as you would have in the case of an on X prosthesis? If the answer is no, then the dental, then the flankless options of the on X prosthesis is not the right treatment for the patient. And the more viable option would be the denture or an overdenture. But if the answer is yes, then I would need to determine how thick the pink acrylic portion has to be in order to obtain a normal uh, nasal labial angle and a full lip support without creating a lesh that it's gonna be difficult for hygiene and a constant sort of irritation to the lip mucosa. So what we want to have is we want to avoid sharp ledges. We want to uh, have a transition zone from the acrylic to the gingival tissue that is sh um, shaped more of a convex surface. Remember, the objective here is not to just fill in missing teeth and tissue, but to have a prosthesis that work in harmony with the facial contour, both in a closed static uh, lip position, as well as doing um, dynamic smile and speech. So for this patient, when we take away the dental flange, we were able to support his upper lip with the shape of the pink acrylic and the position of the denture teeth. So that is how we evaluate lip support for an edentulous patient. What about a patient that still have teeth? Well, the dentate patient come in a variety of conditions. In addition to caries and periodontal disease and what have you, they might have undersupported lip, um, a collapse occlusion, or the incisal S position, or the anterior display might not be where you want it. So can we still perform an evaluation for a dentate patient as we did for a, a previous um, edentulous patients? Well, the answer to that is yes, but it takes a few more uh, laboratory uh, steps. If the patient has collapse occlusions, we need to determine if um, the appropriate video, we need to determine the new appropriate video and centric relations. It's particularly difficult for a patient who has a collapse or unstable occlusion like the one you see on the screen. So to restore this patient with proper facial height, with normal teeth anatomy and normal masticatory and phonetic functions, um, you need to determine the amount of vertical dimension you want to increase. This information will help you mount the diagnostic cast correctly. And the point of having mounted cast is to, for you and your lab to come up with a design of the new teeth arrangement. Just think of it as doing um, a denture wax try in, in you know, because when you're doing de denture treatment, you wouldn't go straight to fabricate a denture without doing a wax try in. So let me show you how you will do a preliminary teeth setup for a patient like this. So to start the process, um, you take a series of intraoral and portrait photo of the patients, which you use to do a digital aesthetic mockup like the one you see on the left side of the screen. And this is to determine uh, where the incisal edge and the position of the teeth need to be. Then you provide this information to your dental lab. Then the lab will do is they will um, fabricate a preliminary full contour wax up and make a polyvinyl or a clear matrix for you to do um, an intraoral aesthetic mockup with temporary material like ProTem. So basically, you will use the matrix they provide you to carry the temporary material to the mouth then you will sit the matrix firmly on the arch. And after the temporary, after the temporary material is set, the matrix is removed. And what you have is um, an exact replica of the proposed wax up in the mouth. From there, you can analyze if your proposed arrangement and verify that it meets the requirement for phonetic, aesthetic, lip support, occlusion, etc. cetera. Um, this intraoral mockup is bonded, it's not bonded to the teeth, and it, cannot, it, it can be removed with, you know, Tour. The pink dash represent the pink dash represent the prosthetic transition zone. Typically, we want that prosthetic transition zone to be about three millimeters above the highest smile line. Then we measure the minimum restorative space we need, starting from the diagnostic reference point, which is the new incisal edge in the anterior and posterior. 
I will talk more about the minimum restore the space for on X protocol in a moment. But for now, I just want to keep, I want to want you to kind of keep that thought in mind. So pretend the ring color line um, is the patient existing bone crest. If the transition zone is more apical to the existing gum line by an X amount, then after the extraction, you should plan to reduce the crestal bone by that X amount. So in the planning software, um, you mark that amount of bone of reduction, and then you plan your implant position at that level of bone after reductions. So basically for dentic patient, this is how we transfer the clinical measurement to your implant planning software. So if nothing else needs to be changed on your proposed teeth arrangement, then after this appointment, you return the wax up to your dental lab, you tell the lab to do cast surgery for the amount of bone you plan to reduce, and then you ask them to um, finish the rest of the wax up and fabricate a set of denture for you to use during surgery. What the lab typically do is they grind up the denture teeth on the cast. I'm sorry, they grind up the teeth on the, on the cast and then set denture teeth on the cast while using the wax up as a reference for teeth position. So the next parameter we need to look for is to evaluate the amount of gingival displays in relation to the patient's smile. We have low, minimum, and high smile line. The dentic patients with the high smile line tend to show more um, gingival display, but we are more concerned with the, with the severe cases of this excessive gingival display because those cases can pose um, a serious ethical and biological challenge when we decide whether it's best for the patient to have excessive bone reduction just for the purpose of gaining adequate restorative space and for us to be able to hide a prosthetic transition line behind the lip. Well, the good news is that not all patients with excessive gingival display are ruled out completely for all next treatment. And how we make that decision is based on um, the etiology and the severity of the excessive gingival display. So let me explain to you why. So first off, short and hyperactive lift or um, arthropastic eruption are considered mild to moderate cases of excessive gingival display. In those cases, um, surgical lip reposition is predictable in moving the upper lip line. Um, however, more severe cases are from vertical maxillary excess and dental alveolar extrusion from bruxism. So in patients with vertical maxillary excess, even if we are moved to, if, if, even if we move the incisor S and the cervical region of the teeth more apically, we still have to do great amount of bone reduction before we can get the, get the transition line behind the upper lip. So on the bottom photo, you have an example, so example of a patient with um, severe bruxism, but without loss of vertical dimension. So basically you have bony extrusion of the upper and lower jaw to compensate for tooth loss due to attrition. So for this patient, um, an extensive full mouth rehab with crown lengthening and a combination of restoration on implants and natural teeth is a viable option, but it, but it can be more expensive and it takes much longer than an all x protocol. But an all x protocol might not be the best suitable option for this patient either because the biological cost from extensive bone reduction might outweigh the aesthetic benefit from hiding the uh, prosthetic transition line. So therefore, for these type of patients, the four implants supported over denture is a more um, conservative approach and a more viable option. So when we see patients with excessive gingival display, we need to determine if they are the right candidate for all next treatment. So we have similar situation with an edentulous patient or soon to be edentulous patient. So here's an example um, of the patients in his 20s. He has a severe decay teeth with long span of missing teeth and he didn't have a prosthesis to maintain the interocclusal space. And over time, um, this caused the downgrowth of the maxilla, especially in the posterior region, while you have a severe resorption in the mandibular posterior. So if you analyze his smile, you see he has um, a very short upper lip line, which means that with an all x treatment, we are gonna to have to do a lot of bone reduction on top of an already um, resorbed maxilla in order to hide a prosthetic transition line. Keep in mind that the level of bone reduction had to be another two millimeters apical to the prosthetic transition zone to allow for soft tissue thickness. 
and looking at the bone level on his upper posterior, doing bone reduction will definitely risk exposing his sinus membrane. So case in point, um, a study by Dr. Hosklaw documented surgical complication in um, on x surgery when too much bone is taken away. So the panograph and the photo are taken directly from his study. The panograph showed the sinus floor um, extend below the horizontal plane of the bone reduction. Um, and during surgery, both left and right sinus membrane was exposed. And because of that, sinus lip procedure was required in order to continue with bone reduction. Now, I'm not saying that this is a deal breaker for RNX protocol, and I'm not saying that there's no surgical solution for an RNX cases where you need to do a, a lot of bone reductions. Um, all I'm saying is that when we do not think about the consequences of um, extensive bone reductions, we increase the surgical morbidity and most likely restore, restorative, restorative, restorative complication. So when we need to, um, so what we need to do is we need to be aware of that. And in my humbling opinion, we should always consider a more considerable approach when the surgical solution is too aggressive. So back to our edential, uh, partially edentulous patients, because of the reason I mentioned, a removable overdenture is a more considerable approach for him so that we can get him through his 30s and 40s. And when he gets into his 50s, then we can consider an on x option. Now, the type of overdenture I'm talking about is the one that sit right on top of, a, of the ridge and the palate and are, and are retained by three to four implants. Um, I don't want to confuse you, but there is another type of overdentures that is called a fixed hybrid. Um, the fixed hybrid type is where the dentures sit on top of a, a custom titanium bar and the bar itself is splinted on three to four implants. We don't want the fixed hybrid option in this particular case because a fixed hybrid option requires just as much a restorative space as an R and X. So in a, in a nutshell, we need to do bone reduction in order for us to hide the prosthetic transition zone and to have um, adequate restorative space to allow for the thickness of the prosthetic. If you don't have enough bone reductions, we will have issue with not only aesthetics, but also with the fabrication and the constant breaking of the, of, of the provisional as well as of the um, definitive prosthesis. With that being said, I do not advocate for um, extreme amount of bone reduction. So if you find that you need to um, remove significant amount of bone in order to hide the transition line, then you should, in my opinion, um, recommend an implant over denture options. So according to host law, the biological consequences from remo removing too much bones can be, in the credit, can be um, in the, in inadequate bone volume and density, uh, which leads to um, the lack of primary stability for immediate loading. Uh, it can cause possible hemorrhaging from the osseous nutrient canal during deep mandibular bone reductions. Um, it can cause possible of sublingual artery damage, which can lead to sublingual hematoma and airway obstruction, which is an emergency um, in your office. Um, it can lead to sinus membrane exposure without the covers uh, from the crestal bone. Okay, so now let's go back to our um, edential patient to see how we create a diagnostic reference point for us to determine the um, restorative space and how we can go about to transfer the, inf the information to the cone beam scan and the implant planning software. So um, for the edentulous patients, if the current denture is inadequate, then you want to start with a new trial denture or wax denture setup. And to get the diagnostic reference point during the scanning, you place sticky radiopaque marker on the dentures and you scan the patient wearing the denture then you scan the denture by itself outside of the mouth with a special setting to scan the prosthesis on the cone beam machine. So the first scan produces the patient anatomy with the location of the um, individual radial marker. The second scan produces the denture with um, the markers as, as one solid object. And the marker allow you to merge the two scan together in one scan by lining up the radio peg marker up that appear on your scan. So the technical term for this technique is called a dual scan technique. And when you have the combined scan, you make your uh, measurement from this um, 
you make your measurement for the, for the amount of restored space and the amount of bone reductions the same way I show you with the dentate patients. And you also do your implant planning on this combined scan. For those of you that want to do guided surgery, the dual scan technique allows you to plan the implant position, the surgical guide, as well as the prefab, um, prefabricated temporary provisional that you use for immediate conversion. Um, I will talk more about the topic of immediate conversion in a little bit later, but I just want to mention it so that you know the capability of a dual scan technique. So for an RNX, the minimum restorative space you need depend on the arch locations, the hygienic preference, and the prosthetic materials. So in the mandible, the hygienic design is frequently used. This type of design is also known as the Montreal bar design. And it consists of dentro acrylic wrapped around a custom titanium bar, but the underside of the bar is left exposed and you have two millimeters of space from the gingival tissue to the um, underside of the bar. And that is for, um, you know, for allow the patient to clean underneath. The exposed polycytaniums reduce plaque retentions and the, gingival, and the gingival tissue response is more positive to a polycytanium as opposed to a porous um, dental acrylic surface. And the total restorative space you need for this type of design is 14 millimeters in the anterior and 16 millimeters in, I'm sorry, 14 millimeters in the posterior and 16 millimeters in the anterior. Now, if the patient does not want to have that two millimeters of hygienic space in the anterior regions, you can use a modified version of the Montreal design. This modified design still have the exposed titanium um, on the bottom, but the titanium surface barely touches the gingival as you can see from the photo on the right side. And the modified Montreal design requires 14 millimeters of restorative space in both the anterior and posterior. However, on the maxilla, the space between the tissue and the, un the underside of the prosthesis should be 100% avoided because of problem with saliva and air escaping during speech. So the hygienic and Montreal design cannot be used in the, um, in the maxilla. Um, instead, an acrylic wraparound with no exposed titanium surface um, should be used. The, um, the acrylic wraparound requires a minimum of 16 millimeter restorative space in the posterior. In the anteriors, it depends on your patient's smile line and you want the prosthetic transition line to be three meters above the smile line the highest smile line, I should say. Um, the restoration should be contoured to have more of a convex surface without any type of ledges so that it doesn't catch food, it doesn't irritate the patient's lip mucosa, uh, it allows the patient to clean with super floss or um, you know, a water pick. And we want a non-erupt and transition from the tissue to the prosthetic for cleansability. So now, instead of using acrylic and titanium bar, you have the option to use um, zirconia oxide or um, you know, some type of reinforced composite polymer. Um, the, cur the current composite polymer um, that currently being used are you know, the PIC or the pectin. Zirconia and, and polymers have superior flexural strength and tensile strength, um, and therefore they do not need a titanium bar for reinforcement. Um, plus the entire prosthesis can be milled out at one piece. So what that means is that we only need minimum restorative space of about 10 to 12 millimeters as compared to um, a 14 to 16 millimeters for prosthesis that um, consists of acrylic and titanium bar. So on the mandible, um, it does not, it, what it means is that it um, allows it to do less crestal bone reduction, but on the maxilla, it still depends on your patient's smile line. Remember, we still have to have the upper prosthetic zone, um, the transition zone three millimeters above the highest smile line. Another type of ceramic on X design is called a root form design. And as you can see uh, with this particular design on the bottom of the screen, the preservation of the gingival contour help you mask the prosthetic transition line. So in patient with um, excessive gingival display, um, this design is an excellent alternative. So let us move to the topic of non-guided versus guided bone reduction uh, and implant surgery for an on X protocol. So the patient we have on the screen went from dentate to fully edentulous. The patient and I decided that we wait for the wrist to heal after the extraction before we proceed with implant placement. 
So I perform a non-guided surgery using um, a denture duplicate as a bone reduction, as well as an implant angulation template. So before the surgery, on the cone beam scan, I measure how much bone I need to reduce uh, from the existing bone crest. Then I mark that level of bone reductions on the buccal surface of my denture duplicate. And I also make um, rectangle windows in order for me to see from the buccal side and for me to verify that I have adequate bone reductions. And I also make um, a horseshoe rectangular window on the palate so that I can check my implant angulations. So what I do is I use a round bird to mark the bone level that I want to reduce to. And after that, I just, it's just a matter of um, taking the, um, the bone, um, re bone reductions reciprocate, reciprocating saw, saw and to kind of cut out the amount of bone that you need. And finally, you just kind of recontour the ridge with a, um, an alveoloplasty bird. So when the bone reduction is done, I place the implant by follow each angulation line I marked on my, dent on my denture duplicate. And you know, this is an analog way of doing surgery and it has worked well for me and it continues to work well for me. And I don't think there's anything wrong with this type of surgery of doing surgery this way. So, but if you wanna do guided surgery, so here's how. Um, the most common type of an all x guided surgery is called a multi-layer surgical guide. And the amount of reductions, the amount of bone reduction and the implant angulation are um, planned digitally. And the bone reduction guide and the implant placement guide are produced uh, with 3D printing. Um, the bone reduction guide serve as a, a reduction template, and, but also serve as a support foundation for your implant surgical guide to sit on. So normally after um, flat reflection, I position and anchor the bone reduction guide with anchoring pins. And after that, I reduce the bone to be kind of flat with the level of the bone reduction guide. And if you are doing surgery this way, the key is to make sure you have a clean and adequate flat reflections so that your guide sit passively on the ridge. Um, one of the biggest benefit of doing guided surgery is that when the guide sit correctly on, on the bone and on the ridge, um, you can be sure that your bone reduction and the implant placement came out pretty much as planned. Um, however, um, I do see people make serious mistakes because they fail to make sure that the guy sit passively and correctly in his final position on the ridge. So the next thing I want to talk about is how we decide where to place our implants. So for the traditional maxillaries um, R and X, you have four options with how you can position the implant to maximize implant fixation. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that um, the method described in the literature recommend that um, you drop one premolar in your final prosthesis. So basically in the final prosthesis, um, you have one premolar and two molars. So as you can see here, in the first configurations, if you have bone uniformly from molar to molar, it's pretty much a straightforward because you can do um, the traditional four implants with two, angle, with two angle posterior implants, or you can do a six straight implants uh, with the most posterior implant position in the second molar position. In the second configurations, if you have bone available from the anterior to the first molar position, you can place four or more implants with two angle posterior implant located in front of the uh, maxillary sinus anterior wall. Um, this way you eliminate the need for sinus lift and still be able to have second molar occlusions without having um, a cantilever extension. Um, in the third configurations, if you have bone available um, to the second premolar position, you can place four implants with two angle posterior implants. Um, however, with, in this configuration, you will have a second molar cantilever length um, that extended from the most distal implants. Um, and in the final configurations, if you have bone only available from, you know, to the first premolar position, but still have at least five millimeters of vertical bone height, you can place four implants, but this time you have two molar extended past your most posterior implants. So I hope that's clear. Now, I do not recommend having a cantilever um, extension that is longer than two teeth. Um, it's because anything longer than that the risk of, um, for posterior implant failure is much higher. Um, and please know that with the angle implants, 
you need to use angle trans um, an angle transmucosal abutment, also known as an angle multi-unit abutment, and that is to help align the path of insertion um, of the posterior implant with your anterior implants. Um, occasionally, you might need to use um, an angle multi-unit abutment on the anterior implant if, um, say, you try to get the access hole lingual to the incisal edge or um, in cases where you have to correct the buccal, severe buccal inclination of the anterior maxilla. So basically for the maxilla, our sweet spot is placing four to six implant without having to do additional bone or sinus augmentation. Um, that way it makes it more affordable for our patient. So now in the case of severe atrophic maxilla, um, you can do alternative implant configurations so as described by Jensen and Adams, the M4 configuration involves anchoring the implant in the pyriform bone after elevating the anterior sinus membrane. And prior to do this, I recommend you that you locate the nasal lacrimal duct on the cone beam scan because the duct located posterior superior, just posterior superior to the lateral pyriform bone. So that's one, that's one alternative. Um, the, the other alternative is when you have minimal bone volume um, at the lateral piriform, um, pyriform bone, um, at the lateral pyriform locations. And when you have this, what you can consider is placing implant using a V4 configuration. With this configuration, um, the apical fixation of the two center implants are in the lateral central incisal position, and they are angled upward 30, uh, about 30 degree um, toward the nasal crest or the vomal junction, the vomal bone junction. Um, the V4 configurations is also considered as a rescuing options to replace failing anterior implants in a patient who already have um, an on for treatment. Now, if you have even less bone than the six options I just mentioned, then you will need to do more advanced bone augmentation and advanced um, placement technique like um, pterygoid or zygomatic implants. So on the mandible, um, the traditional on X on the mandible involve um, two anterior and two um, tilted posterior implants, but you could also do six to four straight implant if you have adequate bone height in the posterior. Um, the tilted posterior implants are placed two millimeters away, uh, two millimeters or more away from the most anterior loop of your eye, of your um, alveolar nerve. Um, and there are reasons why some provider prefer not to place implant beyond the mental foramens. Um, the first reason is because in cases where there is limited bone height distal to the mental foramens, the implants that are placed in front of the mental foramen um, take advantage of the bone volume that you have there. And by doing that, you are able to place um, longer tilted or angle implants without having to do vertical augmentation or having to um, reposition um, the mental nerve distally. Um, the second reason is been because the biomechanical advantage of tilted implants help us increase the anterior posterior spread and therefore reduce the, can the distal cantilever extension. And the final reason is for us to avoid um, the possibility of jaw pain as a result of mandibular flexure. So with regard uh, to the manipulative flexure study from, you know, um, people shown that, uh, from Bides or Schistler shown that only the bone distal, the bone distal to the foramen flexes um, due to the pulling or the action of the lateral pterygoid muscle. Um, and they shown that um, in all next patient with implants that are located distal to the mental foramen on both sides of the jaw, the patient experienced experience jaw pain during um, opening and during protrusions because the, um, the rigid titanium bar that you use to splint the implants uh, from, you know, um, that you splint the implant from one side to another, it doesn't allow the posterior mandible to flex. Uh, with that being said, um, there are other studies that also uh, argue that the mandible flexure is more like a phenomenon, it's a multifactorial, and it does not always happen. Um, since my time in residency to now, um, I, do routine, I do routinely place uh, full arch implants that are located past the mental foramen um, whenever I have adequate bone height in the posterior uh, regions. And so far, I have not found one patient reported you know, with jaw pain. 
but you know, it's certainly something that you still need to watch out for. So from the information that we went over up to now, um, you can see the role of angle posterior implants. And according to Graves and colleagues, um, the success of tilted implants was 97%. And longer um, retrospective study by Mallow um, also substantiate the finding. He found um, a success rate of 98% at five years and 95% at, and at 10 years follow up. So overall, they all found that the ability of um, our ability to place um, tilted posterior implant allow us to um, perform um, immediate posterior implant placement and still be able to um, achieve um, adequate fixation for immediate loading and allow us to shorten the treatment time and lessen the patient's surgical mobility and um, allow us to increase the AP spread without having to add additional implants. So why AP spread is so important? Um, AP spread stands for anterior posterior spread. Well, the reason has been the longer the anterior posterior spread, the greater the biomechanical advantage you will have. Um, it basically allow you to um, extend the prosthesis beyond the most distal implants so that you can reach um, the second molar position. So the original research done by um, English suggests that the length of the, of the cantilever extension can be one and a half times the length of the AP spread. Um, more importantly, um, Ranger showed that we must have a minimum of um, a minimum AP spread of 10 millimeters in order to counteract the compression and the torsion forces on the cantilever. So if you recall, I mentioned that Malo recommend the cantilever extension length should not be more than two teeth. Um, it's because Malo and others show that if you extend more than two teeth, the risk of creating marginal bone loss, uh, fracturing of the implants or debonding of the acrylic or dental teeth in the uh, posterior segment or factor of the prosthesis as a whole is a lot higher. And it can even happen with um, you know, ceramic material like zirconia. So now let me talk about the concept of immediate conversion. Um, the traditional way of doing immediate conversion involves um, locating position of the implant with um, registration material like registeel or exabyte in the mouth. Then you take it out of the mouth, then you drill a hole through your denture, and then you slightly enlarge. Um, the whole diameter to avoid binding of the multi-uni abutments, um, temporary cylinders with the dentures. Then you attach the temporary cylinder to the, um, to the denture with acrylic resin intraorally. And after you remove it out of the mouth, then you reinforce the denture with a, um, a steel wire, um, you know, uh, traditionally with a two, um, two millimeters interbladed steel wire. And then you fill in the rest with additional acrylic to the rim of the cylinders. Um, and then you cut off the distal extension so that all you have is just a second molar position. And then you contour the underside of, um, of the prosthesis to have a convex surface. And then you give it a kind of, you know, a final polish. So there's pros and cons with doing um, traditional or analog conversion. The first is that drilling hole, um, well, the con, the disadvantage is that drilling hole through the denture um, acrylic and drilling hole through the denture teeth make it very thin and more um, successful to factoring and chipping. Uh, until recently when we have um, better acrylic resin that had minimal shrinkage and distortions, the previous version of repair denture acrylic or provisional resin uh, did not bind very well um, to the denture surface. And literature report that the factoring rate of a full arc provisional um, can range between four to 41%. And by far, the most common cause of factor on next provisional is because of inadequate thickness due to um, under reducing the bones. And then other causes of the factoring is from errors in um, errors during the pickup or processing um, of the dentures or the, the provisional, and as well as improper occlusal adjustment or um, you overextending the distal cantilever. Um, the complication with long-term provisional during the healing stage is very cumbersome and it's going to be very time consuming to do chair side repair. Um, it's also very unsettling to our patient because um, it affects the mastery function as well as aesthetics. Um, biologically, uh, fracturing of the provisional um, during healing stage is a huge concern because um, during implant healing phase, it 
factoring of the provisional, it elim eliminate the ability of us to maintain um, cross R stabilization and it disrupt the stress distribution on all of the implants. Um, the, event the advantage of doing immediate conversion this way is um, allow us to modify the dentures to accommodate for the multiple angulation of our implant, uh, especially when we do it freehand. And the other advantage is that it's really reducing the cost. So if you plan to do fully guided surgery, you have the option to have um, a pre-make custom long-term provisional that is um, digitally designed and fabricated from milling high-strain PMA material or from um, injectable denture resin. And this custom provisional have um, pre-drill hole for the size of your template cylinder diameters. And depending on your material selection, you can specify whether you want the to be whether you want the provisional to be reinforced with a steel or titanium bar. Um, the advantage of um, a pre-made custom provisional is that it's more aesthetic and it can save significant amount of chair side time, which increases the patient comfort and enable you to be more productive with your time. Um, and from time to time, you still need to enlarge the pre-drill hole on the provisional because you may have small deviation on the implant positions, even with fully guided surgery. Um, on the flip side of that, um, this custom long-term provisional um, can be very costly. Um, it can cost you from $1,200 to $2,500, and that is the cost that you either take out of from your profit or pass it on to your patient. So what is the purpose of having an immediate loaded long-term provisional? Well, the first is, is provide continuity in speaking and eating ability. Um, it helps us develop a tissue contour um, to receive the final prosthesis. And in order, to do, um, in order to do that, we need to create a convex and a well-polished surface in order to um, scope the tissue and to make it easier for our patient to clean. And um, in order to avoid issue with fracturing of the prosthesis or early bone loss around the implants, we need to avoid, ha uh, we need to avoid uh, I'm sorry, we need to make sure that we have stable occlusions. We need to avoid premature contact or any type of interferences in lateral excursion with our provisional. Um, we need to avoid excessive loading on the most distal cantilever, um, on the most distal implants, but, and we do that by reducing the length of our distal extension. Uh, we need to ensure um, a passive and complete sitting of the temp cylinders onto the multi-uni abutments um, if not, we're going to have mechanical complications such as um, screw, um, screw loosening, uh, screw fracturing, or fracturing of the prosthesis or prosthetic parts, um, as well as biolog biological complications such as pain, um, marginal bone loss uh, due to micro gap or micro um, due to micro gap or micro movements, um, and it can lead to um, osteointegration failure. Okay, so um, you hear me talk a lot. So let's see a procedure in, um, a real procedure in action. Um, in the first case I'm about to show you involve a patient um, in his 40s. Um, he was referred to me from a general provider who has been treating him for peril maintenance. Um, it appeared to me that this individual does not take hygiene seriously. And I'm trying to explain to you what, about, what you're about to see in the video ahead of time so that I don't interrupt the, um, while the video is playing. And as you will see, the patient hygiene is not where I would like it to be. So the day of the surgery, the day of the surgery, we would prophylactically scale the upper teeth prior to doing, prior to doing the surgery. And every, subsequently, uh, every subsequent post-op appointment we have with the patient, we attempt to scale his lower teeth also. Um, the patient might not do their part, but we as clinicians, we have to do ours. Um, I decided to use surgical guide for the surgery in this case, because we have large socket diameters, which will limit bone volume after the extraction. And um, the surgical guide would, uh, would help me precisely position my implants through the septal bone. Um, the amount of vertical bone reduction I have here is about three and a half millimeters. And after the implant placement, I did socket preservation. Then I convert a denture into an uh, into a immediate loaded for our long-term provisional. Um, you will see a PMA provisional in this video, and I will explain to you after the video. Um, just know that 
40 inches of time, the videos, um, I truncate the video to about two minutes. Uh, the full procedure itself take about two and a half to three hours. Um, so without further ado, let me play the video for you. All right, guys, so my intention of showing you this video is because I want to show you that um, as a, con as a con condition, your um, technical flexibility when it comes to um, managing complication is one of your biggest asset. Um, I personally think that it's beneficial for you when you see a presentation that, in that not just incorporate, you know, treatment success, but also complications. Um, the majority of all next treatment I perform typically when with, you know, without any title pickup. But as people often say in dentistry, um, when you do enough of something, you will encounter some type of surgical or prosthetic complications. So our patient um, in the video did not follow um, a soft diet instruction very well. Um, and what this do is um, this led to the delamination of the denture acrylic about one month after the surgery. And at that point, I didn't have a second set of denture to do another immediate conversion. So um, I performed intraoral scanning then I designed a new uh, full arch PMA long-term provisional. And so far the patient has been functioning very well with this PMA provisional. Okay, so we have another patient here. Um, the patient feature in this second video you're about to see um, was referred to me with um, an edentulous maxilla and a partially edentulous mandible. The patient has kind of a V-shaped mandible. Um, she had a minimal ridge width and height in the posterior. So I advise the patient to do a procedure in two stage. The first stage is extraction, um, also with bridge augmentation and possibly GTR procedure to obtain more bone volume and more keratinized tissue uh, for long-term maintenance of the crestal bone and hygiene around the implants. Um, but the patient elected not to do that and she wanted to have the procedure done on one time. So she elected not to have rich augmentations not to have the TTR procedures. Again, guys, the patient ability to afford treatment is key. So what we did is we went ahead and do the extraction, the implant placement, the socket preservation with some minimal GPR all in one procedure. So let me play the video for you.
So in the case you just saw, I utilized um, Neobiotech 3.5 millimeter diameter implants. And for apical fixations, um, I slightly countersunk the implants. Um, the prosthetic design was intended to be a Montreal uh, hygienic arm for design. And because of that, the multi-unit abutments were about four millimeters tall and they are uh, placed slightly super gingerbread. Um, another tech home message that I want you to get from this video is how I performed the immediate conversions. Um, in this case, I utilized a new denture set because her old dentures was not adequate. Um, you saw I reinforced the provisional with a steel wire. Um, you saw that um, I have a nice convex, well-polished surface, which is extremely paramount to the hygiene and tissue health during healing. All right, guys, so that's the end of my presentations. Um, before I take questions from the audience, um, I want to encourage everyone to thoroughly learn and kind of immerse yourself in the fundamental of all next treatment modalities. And as you get better with streamlining uh, all next treatment in your office, um, you want to gain trust from, the, from your patients and you will enjoy a new way of treating patients um, so now let me go to the Q&A box and um, answer any questions you might, might have. So the first question is, um, which case you recommend to use um, mallow versus Montreal prosthesis. Um, the mallow prosthesis um, is an on for prosthesis. The Montreal design is meant for hygienic, but it's still, um, it's still utilized for implants if you want to. So when we talk about the Montreal design, we talk about um, having that two millimeters of space between the bottom of the prosthesis to the, um, to the gingiva, and it typically used uh, with the you know, mandibular on four. Um, and in this case, you have a um, exposed polished titanium surface at the bottom because it's you know, very kind to the soft tissue and the, it's less plaque retention. Um, any more questions coming in? Doctor, I think that is it. Okay, so um, again, guys, you have, have my email. Uh, if you guys think of any questions afterward, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, again, um, I want to thank you, um, everyone, for um, lending me your time. Um, I hope everything I say today was um, informative and help you with your practice. Um, and please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much, doctor, for your presentation. And now then, I will move on to uh, announcements. And stay connected with us on social media page. So our Facebook page is right here. It's Neobiotech USA. And also our Instagram page is Neobiotech underscore USA and YouTube is Neobiotech USA. So stay connected with us on social me media and then uh, follow us and share um, our social media as well. So you could see our up-to-date of the webinars, upcoming webinars, and also see our surgical kits uh, as well. And if you are interested in taking our webinars, you can find upcoming webinar courses in our website at www.neobiotechusa.com and click the webinar at the top right here, then you'll be on our webinar page. And we have another web, uh, and we have um, two webinars, uh, so every Mondays and Thursdays. So total, we have a four webinars weekly, and the date is Mondays and Thursdays, one in the morning from 11 to 12, and one in the afternoon from 2 to 3 p.m. And all these courses are first conference third basis, so register in advance and reserve your spot. We also have a great lecture coming up next week. So first one is on Monday, May 25th on Guide Implant Surgery System with Dr. Spencer Park. And on the same day at two o'clock in Pacific Coast time on the session, one of planning and surgery for extra maxillary zygoma implants with Dr. Dennis Smiler. And then the following Thursday, uh, which is the May 28th, um, 
at 11 a.m. It's the session part two with Dr. Smiler. And the lastly, the same day at two o'clock, it's on the fundamental of reach augmentation with GBR with Dr. Mike Chen, uh, which is at two o'clock. So please save all these dates on your calendars. And now you can also watch previous webinars on our website. If you have missed any of these great lectures, you could anytime go back to our website here and it should be under this previous webinar at the top. Yeah, it's all free and you will find all of our previous webinars in this web page here. And thank you very much for doctors who uh, stayed in TV and also who rejoined it from the morning. Uh, so I want to say thank you. And as part of our ongoing effort to provide a better um, continuing education courses, we would like to request your feedback via a short course evaluation. And one of our, our sales rep will email you this link to complete. And once you receive it, just fill it out, all these questions, and submit it to me. And I will send your CE open completion of the form. And this form should take no longer than five minutes to complete. It's very simple and should look like this. And there should be more questions in the bottom. And thank you so much, uh, the doctor, for participating in today's webinar. And we really hope to see you again next time. And please feel free to contact me if you have any further questions. Um, here's my email, ion.chui and neobiotechusa.com. And also, I want to say thank you again, Dr. Trin, for your presentation today. And thank you all the doctors as well to uh, join us at this time. You're very welcome. Bye-bye now. Thank you, doctors. OK, I hope you, uh, all the doctors, you enjoy your rest of your day. All right, I hope we see you again. Stay safe Absolutely. and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.